Mr. Skowiak. The purpose of this meeting is to let you know that, as I suspect you already know, your mother's not doing well. We've been treating her in the ICU for a month now and things are not going well. And unfortunately, it's time. Believe it or not, it did sometimes happen that way. And although times have changed, we still need to have these very complex goals of care, end of life discussions in the ICU. If you wanna figure out how to do this properly, check out this video. The first step is the planning phase. So before you even set up this meeting, you need to first establish, is the patient decisional? Often in the ICU, people are intubated, they're on sedatives, or they're just critically ill and they're not able to interact with their environment. So, but you first need to determine, is it possible for you to do an awakening trial for them to be cognizant enough to make these decisions for themselves? Because obviously that's the best source of the information for this. This is probably what your family is gonna ask you as well. So go ahead and determine that ahead of time. If that's not gonna be possible, then you need to dig through the patient's chart and or talk to the family to determine if there is an advanced directive or living will. Something in writing that the patient has put into place in advance to direct what we should do in the event that they can't speak for themselves. The next thing you need to do is to determine if there is a legal power of attorney or in the absence of that, who the next of kin is. The next thing you're gonna do is invite all the invested parties to a meeting and you want them all there at the same time because the telephone game is real, people. And especially in this era of COVID where we're having to do a lot of complex discussions over the phone, you can be saying all the right things to mama, but then mama tells auntie something completely different and they, then auntie comes into the meeting upset with you because you said blah, 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 when in fact you did not say any of that. This happens all the time. So you want all the people together at the same time. This is good because you're giving the same information to all the parties and they can also bounce ideas off of each other. And often if you have one person who maybe just isn't understanding it, someone else in their family will be better able to explain it to them. And they use their family members, their trusted people in their lives as their sounding boards. It's also really, really hard to just be one individual making this decision. There's a lot of angst and guilt that comes with this, so it's better for them to have the support of their family and their friends. Before the meeting takes place, determine what your decision points are and when those decision points need to be made. Sometimes you're just having this meeting to give them an update and let them know the course of the way things are going. Sometimes you're having this meeting because you have to make a decision in 30 minutes whether or not you're starting dialysis and it cannot be delayed until tomorrow. So you need to know going into it the specifics about what you're asking of them because once you get involved in it, emotions get high and you kind of go off on these tangents and you, you tend to get lost from what your purpose is. So establish that in your mind before you go in. Common things you're gonna be discussing with your families of your ICU patient with a poor prognosis. Number one, code status you probably should not leave that room without getting an answer to code status. Families will often tell you, well, I need to talk to my other cousin about this, or I need to think about this. You can allow that. I mean, you wanna give them some grace and, let the, and understand that they need a minute to kind of absorb this. But if you give an inch, sometimes they'll take a mile. So often what you wanna to say to people is, this is life and death, and I don't wanna be calling you at three in the morning discussing these kind of things when we don't have time to discuss it. So we talk about this in advance. So I will often tell people, sure, you can think about it, but I need an answer in 30 minutes or an hour, or by the, don't say by the end of my shift, because if you say that, you won't hear back from them, but give them a time frame in which to give you an answer about that. Another common thing that you're probably gonna be talking to them about is if they do elect to do full aggressive care where they're doing all the things, you've established that their person wants to live a life as long as humanly possible, you're gonna to wanna to bring up the trach peg nursing home discussion and what that would look like for them in the future because if that's not the quality of life that this person would want, that sort of affects your code status discussion now. Something that goes along with the full aggressive care discussion would be dialysis. This is often a little bit of a decision point for people. It's sort of a line in the sand, right? So if someone is dying in the ICU, the brain and the kidneys are not protected organs. Those are often the organs that go first. So when families are letting their loved one, you know, stay up in the ICU, giving them as long as humanly possible, one of the first decision points we have to make with this family is, 
would this person want to go on dialysis? And this is another one that they will punt this decision down the road, down the road, down the road. So you need to know going into it, okay, how bad are the kidneys? Is your potassium 6.7? Well, we need an answer like now. No, we can't wait till the end of the day. We need an answer by the end of this meeting. Other things to consider before you go into the meeting are gonna be commonly asked questions that you may not know the answers to. For example, if this is a brain death discussion, you need to know your institution's policy because it varies widely. What exactly is your institution going to pursue once you've established brain death? Because the most gentle and kind thing you can do for this family is say, okay, we're gonna do this brain death study. If it, does, if it is determined that your mom is brain dead, per our policy, we will turn off the ventilator and allow her body to pass within 12 hours or whatever it is. They're gonna to wanna to know that. And when you're sitting in there having these complex, difficult discussions and they ask you a very relevant question like that and you don't know the answer, it, it's, it's re super awkward. So try and answer those kind of questions in advance. Another one that has been a common thing in this era is what's the visitation policy. With COVID and people, some people can come in and some people can't, depending on the institution, depending on if they are COVID positive or not, depending on if it's end of life or not, it all varies. I like to have at least a general idea about what we're doing that day. Something else that you're gonna to have to discuss in most of these talks is gonna be hospice options. If it's a family who says, no, mom would not want to live a life like this, what are our options for stopping all of this? Well, then you're going down the route of having a hospice discussion. And you can't really offer them options if you don't know what options are available to you or to you at your institution. Do you have an inpatient hospice and what does that look like? What's the turnaround time frame for getting someone admitted there? How long do you hold the patient in the ICU after you extubate and start comfort measures? Do you have home hospice? Is that an option for them? Is it someone in cardiogenic shock who might need an infusion to go home with like milrinone? And are there companies around that offer that? You may not know the answers to all these nuances. There's a lot of little variations that can come into it. And the role of the hospice company is to answer those specific questions. And so it is okay to punt some of that, but you wanna have a general sweeping knowledge of how this works. You come across as more knowledgeable and they have more faith and trust in you. I really encourage you to bring a nurse in the room with you, whether it's your bedside nurse or your charge nurse, if your bedside doesn't have time for it, bring a nurse in the room with you who knows a lot more about the specifics about this patient, medications that have been given recently, how they've been doing from minute to minute, some of the institutional policies that you don't know answers to. You come across as a united front when you have your nurse with you. Okay, so now it's time to start your meeting. I always ask my families in advance where they would prefer the setting to be. Some families really want to be in the room with the patient, other families don't. It just varies. So I ask them, do you wanna meet in the room? Do you wanna to come to a separate room? Most people opt to go to a separate room. They can sit down, they can speak with peace in knowing that their person doesn't really have the ability to hear them. Quite often people have a lot of angst and guilt over this. So. I prefer that, but it should be deferred to whatever your family wants to do. You always want to be seated. You never want there to be a position of power shift, so you're never standing. You always find a chair. It indicates to them that you're on the same level with them. It also indicates to them that you have all the time in the world for them, even if you don't. You know, as an ICU provider, you often have a phone and a pager and they may be going off the whole time and you have seven other patients, two of whom may be acutely dying, you don't want your family to be aware of any of that, if at all possible. You want them to know that you understand the gravity of this situation and that it is deserving of your time and your attention. This is a traumatic experience for this family and how you treat it, the deference you give them, the respect that you give them, the time that you give them, they will remember forever. The first thing we do after we're seated is I introduce myself if I haven't already and anybody who's with me. My preference is to call a chaplain after I've delivered all the bad news and then let the chaplain come in and be the hero and sweep up all of my mess. 
After we're all introduced, before I start anything, I have them introduce themselves and tell me their relationship to the person so that I know who I'm speaking with and that all the people that need to be there are already there. And then you start. Now, you start by figuring out what they already know. Because here's the thing in the ICU, most people don't work five days a week. Most people do shift work in this. So it's multiple different providers throughout their stay. And if this is someone who's been here for a while, they may have heard from you know six or seven different providers and they may have heard six or seven different stories. And quite often people are very conflicted. They're like, well, you're saying this. Well, so-and-so yesterday said this. You, you're gonna have to do a little bit of apologizing and customer service kind of thing. And what I always say to people when they're upset about that is, look, if you took your car in for a major repair, would you not want three experts looking at the engine? Even if the three experts give you a different opinion, you're getting as many opinions as possible to help give you the information you need so that you can make the best decision for you and for your person. The other thing this does is puts the ball back in their court and lets them talk for a little bit. And while they're talking, I'm assessing their health literacy, how much they understand about how bad things really are right now. And I don't repeat myself and I don't contradict something that someone else has said. At point in time, I will lay it all out for them. Um, and I tend to be more information is better than less. But you, you have to read your audience. If, you, if their eyes are glazing over and they're not getting it at all, you need to dial it back. And they're the kind of people who either need to know less or you need to bring it down a notch. So things I tell them, one, the diagnosis. This is what they came in for. Two, I will go through the complications that the patient has gone through while they've been there. And for me, in my mind, it's easier to go head to toe. That way you don't skip over anything. And it, kind of makes it easier for them if you break it down by organ system so that they can see all the parts of the body that are affected by this acute illness. And you can see them start to putting these things together in their mind. They'll start to say, oh my gosh, they have a problem with their brain, they have a problem with their lung, they have a problem with their kidneys. And I may even come back at the end and say, okay, this person is in multi-system organ failure. The brain's not working. The heart's not working. We're giving rocket fuel through the IV just to keep the heart going and to get the blood perfused to the body. The kidneys have shut down. Now we're gonna have to do dialysis. Liver's completely non-functional, which is why they're bleeding all the time. And, and they start to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and go, oh, this is a lot for someone to overcome and they may not overcome this. And that's why they're so sick. I talk about the treatments that we've done thus far. Here's what we've done to try and correct the delirium. Here's what we've done to try and help the heart. Here's what we've done to try and treat this pneumonia. And at that point in time, I'll go into what the challenges are ahead of us. You know, I kind of come back to this dialysis talk a lot because this is something that we do a lot. Um, it, it tends to be like the next step. But at this point in time, dialysis is sort of like putting a band-aid over a hole in a dam. You know, the dam is here, the body is the water behind it, and you have all these leaks springing out. The main problem was the body of water, but now you have all these various different things going wrong, all these leaks that are being sprung, and you're just trying to put band-aids over them. Well, dialysis isn't gonna fix that big body of water, the big problem that they're here for. All it's going to do is put a little band-aid over it and buy a little bit of time. This is why the decisions that we have to make are complicated because even though we have these tools available to us, we have to determine as a family if this is the right thing for this person knowing that it won't fix the problem. And you start talking about the overall prognosis. And if we do want to do all this and if this person would want to live their life as long as possible, you're looking at probably permanent dialysis, although we won't know that at this venture. You're looking at a tracheostomy, you're looking at a peg or a tube into the stomach, and you know, you're not really gonna be able to take care of this person at home because of these needs, or are you? That's something you may have to discuss. But if you aren't, then this is someone who's going to have to live the remainder of their life in a nursing home. So you wanna paint a picture for what you think their ultimate outcome will be because quite often these families are making decisions for the here and now, but they really have to make decisions for the future. What is their capability of caring for someone like this? And would this person want to live a period of time, if not forever, on the support of machines, AKA life support? So at this point, you've given them the diagnosis, you've summarized their course, you've talked about the complications ahead of you, and you've given them prognosis. 
Now you need to circle back to here's what our decision points are here today. And you're gonna go back to that step that you established earlier. First and foremost, I start with code status. If this person is that sick, then what are the odds that they would survive resuscitation efforts? If God forbid the nurse walks by the room and the patient is flatlined on the monitor and the patient is dead, use those words, that's key, use those words, dead. Do we want to put their body through the suffering that could be inflicted with CPR and shocks and all of these things to bring them back, knowing that the odds of bringing them back might not be very good? Or do we just let them die peacefully? Answers they may give you, one, they may say, yeah, do all the things. I want you to do everything you possibly can to extend their life as long as possible. That's when you're gonna be doing the discussion about trait, peg, nursing home, and that that could be their future and how that looks. They may come back middle of the road and say, well, I don't want to do any more to hurt them, but I'm also not ready to stop. So this would be a situation when you're talking about full care with treatment limitations. And you can be very specific about this, we're not gonna add a second presser. They're already on Levafed. When we max out on Levafed, we're not going any higher than that. Or we're doing everything that we can for this person right now, but we're not gonna say yes to dialysis and we're not gonna say yes to tracheostomy. That's a perfectly reasonable option that many families I find are okay with. The big thing with this is that a lot of people have a very hard time being responsible. They have a hard time being the person saying the words, let my mom die or let my dad go or no, nope, don't do that. Just let them go. It's very hard to, for people to take ownership of that. They want the person to tell you, but in the absence of them being able to tell you, they have a lot of angst and a lot of burden on their shoulders and they have a very difficult time owning that. So this middle of the road option is quite often what works for a lot of people and allows them to go forward with their life with peace, knowing that they did what they can. Your goal should be whatever their goal is. Your goal is to obviously take care of your patient, but also realizing that at this point in your mind, you've sort of already decided that this person probably isn't going to survive this. The people who are gonna survive it are all of the family members. And the road that you help lead them down is gonna take them on a path in which they look back on this with peace or with angst. And you have the power to help give them that. So if they decide on a middle of the road option for their person, let them have it and be respectful of that. I feel like a lot of people, especially some of my bedside nurses, get really torn up about this. They feel like it, they're still torturing this person that's in the bed. But we have to be respectful of what our patients and our families desire, even if it's not what we think they should desire. The next option is gonna be withdrawal. So your family may already be decided. They may say, you know what? Grandpa was 85, he lived a good life, and he told us he didn't want any of this anyways. And so it may be fairly simple. You, you start with your code status, nope, not gonna resuscitate. They, a lot of times, will even prompt you, well, well, what do we do now? Because we don't wanna continue any of this. So be prepared to do some discussions about withdrawal of care. Now I say withdrawal, okay? All my palliative friends will say that's a bad word <laughs> because that indicates to families and people that we're taking away care. We're not. We're still providing excellent care for this person. We're gonna provide symptom management. We're gonna make their passing as peacefully as humanly possible. So don't use the words withdrawal. Use instead, we're going to offer comfort care. Our goal is going to shift from aggressive resuscitation and survival at all costs to let's make this person comfortable for the time that they have remaining so that you can enjoy your time with them and be rest assured that they are comfortable and not suffering. So then you go into the things that you are going to do for them. You may say, you know, if this person's intubated, you have to do a little bit of talk about how the, the tube coming out works. And it kind of varies based on who your nurse is that day and the institution you work at. Some people want to stay in the room. Some, some places want all the family to leave the room for a little bit of time so they can take the tube out and clean them out and let them right back in. I say whatever works for the family and the place where you work is perfectly fine, but the family is often gonna ask you what the process is. That's where it's great to have your nurse in the room with you to, to answer those kind of questions. Then you're gonna to wanna to talk about how the end of life process works. They are almost always gonna ask you how long it takes. You're always gonna say, I don't know, because you don't, but you can kind of get a general sense. I mean, if your person is in extremis, if they're on four pressors, 
and they have no brainstem reflexes, you know as soon as you pull that tube out, you've got seconds or minutes. So those are the people that I will often say to the family, we're not gonna proceed with this until you guys all are here and all say you're ready. Because once we take that tube out, I don't, it probably won't be very long. And I want you all to have the opportunity to say what you wanna say and say your goodbyes and make your peace before we go down that road. But you also wanna prepare your people that it may take a while. Some of the people that you're de-escalating on could take days, if not weeks. And you, the last thing you want is to take that tube out and the patient be gurgling for days and days and days on end and the family not have been aware that that's a possibility. So you're gonna tell them, you know, this could take some time. We turn off all the sedation drips, we take the tube out, and then we see what symptoms the patient gives us. If they're short of breath, morphine is excellent for that. If they're having trouble controlling their secretions, we have medications for that. If they're anxious, we have medications for that. If they look like they're in pain, we have medications for that. And you, you lay out all the various different um, fears that people have about the dying process and how you intend to make that process smoother. So to wrap things up, there are three tips I'm gonna give you. Number one, use actual words. Don't be afraid to use bad words like dead. Don't say past, say dead. Be respectful. It's gonna be hard for them to hear. Use those words. It takes away any confusion. Two, talk to their level of literacy. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but if they understand a lot more, give them more. If they don't understand as much, give it to them on their level so they can understand the decision they're making. And three, be comfortable with silence, okay? There are gonna be moments of silence. I don't consider them awkward, okay? These are just moments in which, I mean, you're dropping a bomb on these people, right? And they're taking in some very bad information in a very rapid amount of time. And they're gonna be hit with a lot of emotions. And sometimes they just need a minute or a couple of minutes to let them wash over them and if the tears come, that's good because it generally means they're in a place where, okay, the, they're letting the emotion out instead of bottling it up and they're ready to hear what you have to say next. But give them a minute, give them a minute to take that in. Because if you just keep on hammering and hammering and hammering them and then end with, okay, we have to make a decision right now, they're gonna be overwhelmed, they're gonna shut down. So be comfortable with moments of silence while they absorb it. And to wrap up your discussion, you're going to summarize what you talked about and you're going to recap the decisions that have to be made and the time frame in which they have to make them. Hopefully they've been asking you questions all along, but they may not have. So at the end, say, do you have any questions? Have I answered all of your questions thus far? These are hard discussions, y'all. Some people are more comfortable with them than others. I, in particular, love doing this talk. It brings me so much peace and fulfills my soul, but not everybody feels that way. The more of them you do, the more comfortable you will get with them. Just recognize that you will have a learning curve with this. It is hard. Once you've done a couple, you'll realize that people really love you for this. You are their guide in this. You are helping them navigate these really tough waters and bringing them through a very emotional journey. And generally at the end of it, they love you for it. They will always remember you. You will always be a part of this tragic journey that they're going on and you can ease it for them. You can bring them so much comfort and peace during this time. So give it the time and the empathy that it's due.